length that doesn't have length or doesn't have bend, right? Like a short a short guy with no bend, basically. What yeah. what NFL pass rusher is any good? Yeah. You know. And I mean, the only person that I could think of, like in the NFL right now, I was like maybe Matt Judon. You know what I'm saying, but uh, uh, but he was like Matt Judon's got the length, and I looked it up, and Matt Judon's arms are like thir- over 33 inches. So it's like, oh, okay, yeah, he's got a point here. You you know, you either have the length or you have the band. So it's okay, you can still be impactful. But I don't know if you're going to be dominant if you're not, if you don't have the bend. Like if you have the length, you could be impactful. Like Jadavion, Jadavion Clowney is impactful, but he's not. Is he? Is he? Did, did he ever play up to his first round, first overall pick? Probably not. Mm-hmm. You know, but exactly. That's has, what I'm saying. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Thibodeau just doesn't have any bend. So like, yeah, he's going to fall. He doesn't have bend, guys. That's what it is. But uh, that's see the thing is, is we haven't even started yet. But I yeah, we say, yeah, we're Okay, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> I just want to say. That this okay. is how I feel about quarterback height. Like everything you're talking about, like you don't take a small short quarterback in the first round. You wouldn't take a defensive end that's six and one to twenty in the first round, top five. You wouldn't do that. So why take a six foot quarterback? Like you just anyways. Anyways, guys, we're back, everybody. Everybody, we're back. We're live. Uh, it is take don't lie. It is your favorite Raiders podcast, favorite Raiders channel, favorite Raiders everything uh you know we are back you guys already know what to do gotta hit the subscribe button hit the subscribe 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 hit the subscribe button there uh yeah make sure you guys do that hit the like button if you like it hit the dislike button if you don't like it hit you know leave a comment if you like it leave a comment if you don't like it you guys already know what to do follow us on twitter at the mark john nfl at bd williams 18 also follow my dude m holder 95 i just want to go give a shout out to shout out to matt he's grinding man so please check out his scouting reports guys because he's on silver black pride just grinding like crazy he's been busting like eight three a day and i, I want him to get some <laughs> he's literally busting out three a day so check out my dude m holder 95 uh, I know his eyes are bleeding right now. He's bleeding, bro. Like he's just three. It's literally like, I'm like Matt, bro. Like relax. I mean, hey, hey, he loves the draft. That's what he's there for. So make sure you follow him too. Definitely extended, uh, extended uh, TDL network guy. So how are you guys feeling today? I, I see you. Uh, we got some international people from uh, Brisbane. Oh, we got some Australia people. Australian Raiders fans. Raiders, Raiders international. Hey, look, look, guys. You know if you if. If you're a Raiders, anything content creator, you're international, period, because Raider Nation is international. You know, when we look up uh, where our engagement comes from on YouTube, it's all over the world. People are literally logging in from every single continent. It's incredible uh, the amount of support Raider Nation gets. So it's always been international. You go, you, you know, you go in to any country, you might even see someone with a Raiders jacket. You might see, you know, the Raiders gear on. I see it. I live in New Jersey. I see Raiders gear all the time in New Jersey. So it's it's always a um, nation nationwide worldwide Raider Nation uh, gotta love that. Also something that um, I just gotta make sure we get uh, we get this across. Finally yeah. got the gear shop in the description. A lot of people okay. uh, ask how do we support the channel? Where the gear shop is in the, uh, in the description. The link is in the description. Um, so make sure you hit up the gear shop. There's some shirts. Uh, there's a couple of hoodies. I know it's it's probably getting a little warm for the majority of people out there um so yeah also here at the gear shop and if you want to just uh donate to the channel like jimmy harris holla at you jimmy harris incredibly uh generous so we appreciate that uh yeah so what what do you got today marcus you're gonna break down some offensive linemen in, in the draft here yeah so what i'm gonna do i'm gonna go over every round i think the value of that round player you guys might disagree uh with some of these guys but i'm going with uh guys who i think they fit the value of that round so we're going third round we're going fourth round we're going fifth round and we're going seventh round since those are the picks i didn't go two fifth round guys because i mean it's just kind of just redundant so i did i pick a i picked a, a lineman from every round that i think if the raiders took them it would be a great value so okay. uh, that's what I'm going over i'm going over value draft picks today doing some value like for pff because pff loves to uh give players value so that's what we're doing today Value before they even play? Yeah, value before they – I mean, PFF just looks at uh, NFL players like they're not human. That's what I kind of figured out. Yeah, tell me about it. Uh, okay, cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be um, 
So I'm going to be looking at Jayon Brown. I promised everyone that I'd be doing Jayon Brown. Got to say, it's probably the most boring tape that I've looked at this offseason. I agree with it's that. It's tough to – Tough to get through, honestly, uh, I'm gonna, and I'm going to show you why in, in a second. And I really wanted to look at some corners, and I watched quite a few corners uh-huh. um, who kind of fit kind of this profile. Um, if we have time, I'll talk about Patrick Graham's profile for the corners that he drafted, um, okay. you know, as in the three years as a coordinator. So if you have time at the end of the show, we'll just talk about it. I didn't get a chance to uh, actually create like a, a clip uh, of any of these corners. So if we have time, otherwise I'll just maybe save it for the next one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, so the viewers. I mean, we are putting together like a Raiders draft board this year, so we're, just, we're basically just focused on the Raiders. I'm not trying to do like a whole top 100 like I did last year. Kind of just focusing on what the Raiders are going to take. We got third. You know, we got what four rounds. We're not really getting too fancy yeah. here. It's all back end. You yeah. know, so it's back end, right? Yeah, it's, it's all back end over here. So you know, we're, we're going to do a little cool draft board. Um, you know. I mean, I wish the Raiders could draft Kenneth Walker because I think he's the perfect fit. But you know, he's, he's, you're not going to get Kenneth Walker at 86. It's just not, not going to happen, you know. So <laughs> it's just it's a lot of things like you know, like you know, I watch these players, and I just get jealous. To be honest, yeah, Man. it's a it's a drag. It's a drag because I'm, I want to watch you know these really good corners and safeties, but there's like they're not going to be there, you know. I, and I was even under the impression that Jalen Petrie might be there, but then after I did the breakdown and you were like, nah, he's probably not going to be there. And everyone on Twitter was like, nah, he's, you know, top 50 or something. So yeah. shoot, man, you know, uh, it, it's, it's definitely tough when first Raiders pick is going to be 86, I think is the, the first pick. Uh, so yeah, it, it takes away like all the good players or, you know, all the fun players to watch early on and one or two of them are, are might be available or something like that at 86, but it's really narrowing down our options in terms of creating content for you guys. So I hope that you guys don't get bored looking up, you know, some of these seventh round values, right? <laughs> looking at these seventh, the seventh round values. Hey, we're looking, we're gonna look at it. all right, Angel. Yeah, yeah, we got you. We got you. Okay. Seventh, seventh round, you know what I mean? Like you never know. You never know, you know. I mean, there's really not a lot of great seventh round picks. Yeah, yeah. You, you, your mic is going a little now, but you're good. But uh okay, I got yeah, you. A lot, a lot of seventh round picks, you know, that are, you know, that aren't that good. I mean, yeah, you might find some undrafted guys that, uh, in, uh, you know, McDaniels and then they love undrafted players. So, I mean, they're big undrafted guys. I mean, like David Andrews is undrafted, you know, JC Jackson, Malcolm Butler, whatever, you know, whatever the, you know, the, the undrafted players they come from, which, you know, watch out for Slade Bolden, which I wanted to t- talk about. I mean, I think there's going to be a battle between the Patriots and the Raiders in a fight for Slade Bolden. It's going to be very, very interesting to see that because, I mean, I, I think that he could be come in and be that Danny Amendola to Hunter Renfro. A little Slade. Got a little Alabama pedigree. So, I don't know, be you want me to go ahead and uh, get into my thing first or want to get your... Uh, yeah, go ahead. My go. Stuff. Okay. All right. So, you know, today, I'm you know, we're going over the offensive line. You know, it, it, it's... You know, with Tom Cable, we did a lot of like, what, like long arms, who got this arm, who got this height, who's got this kind of arm length, hand length, size. With, you know, the guys coming over from the Patriots that are now, the, you know, the Raiders coaches, you know, Carmen Brasillo, and, you know, he's, uh, you know, he was handpicked by uh, Sarnakia to come from Youngtown State to come be an assistant by, under him because he's an offensive lineman. Uh, coach for Youngtown State for the longest. So he got picked by Sarnakia to come be his mentor. He then eventually took over for Sarnakia. And, you know, there's no rhyme or reason to the draft picks they pick. I mean, they really, I mean, the only thing that they do is they pick, they don't pick small school guys, which is something I noticed. I mean, just over time, like even when Josh Daniels was with the Broncos, and he was the GM. He never picked really. He never took small school guys. It's like No. Sean Reynolds from Georgia, you know, Demarius Thomas is from Georgia Tech, you know, Tim Tebow's from Florida, you know, uh, Zane Beatles is from Utah, I believe. Um, so you you see, you that's I wouldn't expect any small school guys to this draft. We're taking big school, Big Twelve, Power Five, whatever. So and you know, teams with a lot of pedigree and a lot of good coaches, right? So. Um, we're going over that today, you know, so let's just, let's just get it started. Let's get it going here on my side. Here. Okay. 
this room you know where they are I don't know if you can see that a little bit here all right so we're starting off today with uh round three my dude Cade Mays from Tennessee offensive tackle he can play guard as well played a lot of guard at the senior bowl to held his own so he's very versatile which is one thing that you know Dante Sarnecchia Carmen Brasilio, which they love, is versatile players. That's why Brandon Parker is still there, because he can play left and right tackle. You got Shaq Mason, who can play center and guard. You got Isaiah Wynn, who can play guard and left tackle. So versatility is a big thing for them. That's why I think they love a player like Cade Mays. Will Cade Mays be there? I'm not sure. We, well, you guys decide from watching this tape. <laughs> but I think if he is there, it's a great third-round value. So you see here? He's getting – his pad level is always a little high. That's one thing that you got to work on with Cade. But Cade, he has great hands, and he has a great base. But his pad level is a little high. You see 87 getting under him a little bit there. But he's still able to recover and still get a pancake. All right, 87. 87 really got abused today on this, on this game. He really just – I don't know what he was thinking going against Cade here. But you see him. He even tries to do a little jump set against Cade. Um, you know, one thing I like about – you see – K gives a little fake punch here. Ooh, oh, look, fake punch, right? Fake punch gets him, which is some technician stuff right there. And you see, he just, oh, no, he's not going anywhere. 87 is not going anywhere. So, I mean, if they can get this guy in the third round, because he can play right guard or right tackle or the guard position, which is their hole. So if they like Leatherwood, they want to they put a Lunar on the bench he's, or whatever through bad play. You know, Cade Mays is somebody that can come in and play right away. Here he is against 87 one more time. 87 tries to get a little jump here. Cade doesn't fall for it, and he just throws him into the ground. And he's just a mean dude. I love mean offensive linemen. I don't know about you guys. Here's a nice jump set against five. Gets a good jump set right there, right? Hands a little outside, but you still got some, some good hand movement. You still got the strength. His, his base is good. You see his feet are very well, right? You know? Great feet and another pancake. Throw him in the ground. Great job, Kate. It's just pancakes all day, guys. It's just, I don't know. These, these Pittsburgh offensive linemen have to have a bad day here. Right here, his pad level's still high, right? I mean, against some good defense tackles, defensive ends, he's gonna, he's, he needs to have a lower pad level. I, I know he's a big guy. He's a pretty tall guy. to put his height. You guys can look it up. I'm not 100% sure his height, but it doesn't matter with the, Ra with the Raiders now. It doesn't matter height. It, can you play, basically? And do you come from a big school? And which is Cade Mays comes from? He comes from Tennessee. You see him, right, letting the guy go around the bout, giving his quarterback a chance to come up in the pocket. You see him over time, another another good one, another jump set here, right? Jump set, and 36 has no shot. Just keeps allowing to go around. Where are you going? So Cade Mays, great tape, right? Great tape from Cade. Will he beat in the third? I don't know. Depends on if there's a run on defensive players, which I think there might be because it's a defensive draft. Now, this is a, a somebody that, you know, a lot of the Raiders fans were asking about during the Senior Bowl, Daniel Falele, right? Big old dude, 6'8", 380, you know, didn't have a, a, a really good athletic profile that you like to see from somebody that big. But, I mean, it's 380? Oh, yeah, he's man. 6, 8, All right, so here we go. And. What I like about him is he's just a little bit of a mauler. You see here, boom, just mauling people. Mauling that guy. He doesn't have great technique at all. He's really terrible technique. But that's why you take him in the fourth round. That's why I don't think he's going before the fourth round. There's really no buzz around him right now, especially even with his height, because he didn't have, I mean, he didn't have a great athletic profile. They thought he was a better athlete than he was. And he's really not a great athlete, to be honest. He's not the best athlete in the world. Right. But you see the power that he has. This is a double team right here. Right, a little inside zone run. There he's right there on the double team on 58. But even him being 680, he still has a problem with his pad level. He, he can't get low enough in the lowest guy sometimes, but he's still, still the power there with the pancake. What a terrible throw. Jesus Christ. All right, here we go. Uh, his against George Carlaftis, Mr. First Rounder, get another jump set here, right, against Mr. Carlaftis. And you see that Carlaftis doesn't have, he really doesn't have good technique. Carlaftis has his hands inside, his hands are outside, like John Simpson. We talked about that. But he's just so big. I mean, what is Carl Lafayette going to do? I mean, he's just, he's just so wow. big. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Here he is once again. Right? And, and, and you see, like, his hands are outside again. Has, I don't know what this, this base is. It's disgusting. 
you know, his technique is all over the place. This is not great technique, but Carlos Vives, just know where to go. Where are you going, Carlos? Where are you going, though? Where are you going? See, I mean, that's something that the, the Patriots guys, you know, I keep saying that. The Raiders offensive lineman coach that come from the Patriots will love because, okay, I can work with that. If I get his hands inside and I can fix his feet, I got Trent Brown, right? So another guy I really like is Donovan West. I may be a little bit homer of this. ASU forks up, hashtag. But I really like Donovan West, fifth rounder, center, right? So he's a center here. Great pedigree, good combine. See here, great hands inside, great technique right there. This is picture perfect center technique right there. It's awesome, right? Until he's coached up really well. Here he is, a little outside zone work, right? Good bump there, then gets back up to the linebacker, right? Good run right there. I really love his take from Donovan West. See him on the pool here. So no, he's he can, versatile. He can move. He's a, yeah, he can move, right? So he sees he's versatile right here, running some power on a pool, makes a great block there. I know this is versus Southern Utah. I know that. But, hey, we're seeing for some technique here. We got to get the, all the all-22 we can get. I know it's Southern Utah. Fine. But here we go. <laughs> right? So here we go. Once again, this is great technique. Again, good punch. You see you see, you see everything. Like this, If you just look at – remember Phil L.A. And look at 61 here. Right? And 66 is another guy I'm looking at, but I didn't want to feature him. Uh, Kellen Dietrich is from Texas A&M. He runs a 489. Let's do 66. Ridiculous. Wow. Right? But you see here a little – it's a little hug, a little pancake there. Chance for the quarterback to make a play. Now, this guy I interviewed. This might be a little biased. I interviewed him. But in the seventh round, I think Josh Rebus is a steal. This dude has great tape. He's just not very athletic. Right? But this is the perfect – for Carmen Brasillo, they, they don't look for athleticism in, in, in their offensive linemen. They would look for talent. And that's what Josh Rivas has. And, you know, I didn't really feature his tape during the interview, but, you know, we're going to break this down today. So, right here in the seventh round, you see him get to the second level here, right? Not really the second level, but get up on this lineman. Good technique. Gets his hand back inside if he has it inside. So, you see his hands are outside a little bit, but he got this hand back inside, right? So, he, just, just good technique there. Gets a great push on him. Ball doesn't go his way, but you see the push that he got there, right? See here, he gets a pancake, right? Little outside zone motion here. Quick pancake there for Revis. Get him on the ground. Does nothing. The guy wants to hold. No, you just got pancake, dog. Just got pancake. So here we got here again, 76 again. Watch here, right? On a little pull, outside pin pull, right? Get him outside. Then you get him on a safety. This is when you know if he's a good offensive lineman or not. If he's getting have a little safety capacity. Yeah, safety keeps running. Just push him to the ground. <laughs> so like, you know, and Josh got a little mean streak to him, too. And this is what you like to see here on the pool, right? Watch him get this pancake right on 30. Linebacker. Like you see the pad level he gets, too. Josh is just a technician. Everything, hands inside. Hands, you see the elbows perfectly inside there, too, right? Push, take it to the ground. There's nothing there. He's in it helping his uh, running back at six. And then, you know, in pass protection, this is one of my favorite pass protection plays. So you see here, you know, he's got a blitz coming from the middle. His center went the wrong way. I'm pretty sure his center was not supposed to let this guy go. I'm just taking a guess. Maybe he's letting him go for 22. I might be wrong there, right? Let's him go. 22 picks it up. 22 misses. So watch Revis here pick this up. He's got a double blitz coming. So Revis comes off. He knocks both these guys off. He knocks 34 off, and then he comes and he knocks off 23 a little bit, helps the quarterback step up, gets a first down. Uh, that's not seventh-round tape, Marcus. <laughs> it is, though. He has no buzz, bro. It is seventh-round tape. <laughs> that is seventh-round tape. Hey, hey, hey. He has no buzz. Have you heard anything about Josh Rivas? No, uh, other than you. But, I mean, come on. That, that kind of play – all right, that's the kind of stuff that Quentin Nelson was doing. All right, R correct me if I'm wrong. Remember all those plays where Quentin Nelson's like coming across the formation and helping out on blitzes, you know, that people are missing, you know, like that. I mean, I don't know, that, that's better than seventh round, man. If you're telling me that's a seventh rounder, sign me up any day of the week. That's, <laughs> that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And, and, and I, that's the type of guy that the, Ra the, um, the Raiders would like because um, he's just good on tape. Like they, they really don't with offensive linemen, they don't care about measurables. They care about the tape with offensive linemen. 
if that's basically what they look at. I mean, Shaq Mason is what? What is he? Six two. Really, yeah, he's not really impressive. I say a win is undersized, right? He's undersized. supposed to be a guard. They're like, you're going to play tackle yeah. because we think you have the technique to play tackle, right? You're going to play tackle for us. Um, so uh, I, I think that some of these offensive linemen can really help. Like uh, Falele, I, I think he's a very develop, developmental player. You take in the fourth round, this type of player you want to take in the fourth round, yeah. who has that size, right? And maybe you can, he can develop into something. And then, you know, you got Brandon Parker on a one-year deal, then, you know, Falele becomes your swing tackle the next year. And then maybe he's a starter or whatever, you know? And then you maybe you feel better with Leatherwood uh, Leather inside, and maybe he's a backup somewhere for you somewhere, right? Um, definitely a player you could develop. Um, same with uh, Donovan West. I, I really liked his tape as a center. I think he could really come in and help out if Andre James doesn't work out. You get him in the fifth round. Because, I mean, Donovan West doesn't have a lot of buzz around him. So, you know, that's why I, I slotted him in the fifth round. I think his tape's a little better than that, though, too. But he's a center. And, you know, this, that's the value of centers. Right. They don't have the best value no. it there, right? They're not the best value that you can say. So fifth round for a center is not crazy. And then, of course, Josh Rivas, I think he's a steal in the seventh. I, I was pretty shocked when he asked for the interview and I watched the tape. I was like, man, why does, why are you at the NFL PA Bowl? I understand that. That's why I asked him about, like, why does he does he feel like he was kind of undercut not going to the Senior Bowl since he has be, basically has better tape than, like, the, half the linemen that went there? Um, you know, and, you know, uh, he's well, a very I mean, humble guy. Yeah. But, if it's not yeah. Senior if it's not senior Bowl, I mean, the Senior Bowl – Jim Nagy, he's the director of the Senior Bowl uh, for people who might not be initiated, you know, or super into dra the draft like maybe we are. Um, but uh, by the way, let me know if my mic is going in and out still. So, you get, you get 100%. You get it. Okay. Um, but the way that they put the Senior Bowl together is they don't, they, they don't take the players that they want. They talk to the NFL. Who are you looking at? And then those are the players that get invited to the Senior Bowl. So if Rivas didn't get you know, invited to the Senior Bowl, then you're right. There isn't a lot of buzz on him. They're not super high on him, uh, you know, for whatever reason that is. And obviously, honestly, there's just a lot of players. <laughs> you know, there's yeah, tons of players. So, uh, you know, sometimes you want to see these guys like Fa'ala Fa Ele, however you pronounce that guy's name. Um, you want to see some of these guys who might have like the measurables. We want to see how they compete and if they take to the coaching and stuff like that. Whereas a guy like Rivas, where the, you know, the technique's already there, what are we going to see? He already played at a yeah. high level. What are we going to see at the Senior Bowl? Um, so, yeah, I mean, that might be like, it's tough. Cut. Those are some tough cuts that you have to make for the Senior yeah. Bowl. Uh, obviously, not everyone can play. Um, but I want to talk to you about the Tennessee guy. Okay. okay. How tall is he? He's like six eight. Six eight. Six eight. Wow. Because he's really, he's really thick too. He's got some really thick uh, legs and arms. He look he's, he looks like a beast. That guy, you know, um, with the, you know, um, that little feint, like almost like the boxing move, like the fake hands, and then you know you, you force that defensive end to put their hands up. Right. That reminds me of Donald Penn. You know, those kind of like really savvy moves that Donald Penn would do, even though he wasn't like the greatest profile for a tackle. He just had all the savvy and the technique where he was able to dominate out there despite being like a late round pick, you know, kind of a shorter, heavier guy at, at tackle position. But um, if you're saying this guy is 6'8", man. No, no, he's not 6'8". I'm, I'm my bad. I'm, I'm, I want to make sure I get that right. So he's 6'4", 3 fourths. Six four, six four, and then what, like three thirty or something like that? That's Donald. Three eleven. Three eleven. Yeah, but I mean, he has a, he has a uh, eighty two and a half inch uh, wingspan, thirty four uh, inch arms, hand size uh, ten inches. Uh, I mean, his ten yard split's kind of weak. That's why you know. That's why I feel like he could be had in the third round. But his three cones really good. Seventy eight percent percentile for his three cones. Seven point five seven. Shell's pretty good, but you, that's what I'm talking about. They, they don't look at, they don't look at this stuff with tackles, and, and he he has the same profile as Larry Tunsil. So it's, I mean, and Zane Beatles. So just, there you go. There you go. <laughs> so, I don't know. He's 84 percent compared to, to Zane Beatles on mock draftable. So yeah, there you go. Zane Beatles, second round, I think it's third round pick for uh, Josh McDaniels who. I mean, Joshua Daniels did help build that a Super Bowl team for the for the Peyton Manning. He just didn't have Peyton Manning at Kyle Norton instead. So crazy what happens when you have a good quarterback, huh? <laughs> so.
<laughs> and a great quarterback with no neck. <laughs> I still can't beat 55 touchdowns with no neck, bro. It's crazy. All right. Well, um, yeah, nerve damage in his uh, in his throwing arm. So. Yeah, just throw 55 touchdowns to Julius Thomas. <laughs> Dem- Demarius Thomas, too. Don't, don't forget. Well, I mean, Demarius Thomas is good, though. I mean, Demarius Thomas yeah. is doing 80 yards with Tim Tebow. I mean, 1,100 yards with Tim Tebow. That's different. You know. Beast. Tebow. Yeah, but anyways, RIP uh, DT. RIP. Yeah. All right, all right, BD. Uh, any other thoughts? Let me see if we have any questions here. Let me answer real quick. So one question that I always get is about level of competition. There's a, quite a few in here, a level of competition, I think probably because the ASU tape that you were able to get. And let me also preface this, just what you said. We don't have every single tape. OK, some people got mad at me when I put uh, Nate Hobbs, Illinois versus so whoever. And they're yeah, they're still mad at me to this day about this. And, and they're like, you chose his worst game. I'm like, that's the only game I had. And he was terrible. And so what do you want me to do here? You know, like, um, but yeah, so like we don't have every single we don't have every single tape. We got to just show what the tape that we have is, you know, um, until we get maybe, you know, some better contacts or we can get some black market film or something like that. You know, it's it's going to have to be like this. Hired by the athletic. Well, yeah, I mean, like if we get black market film, we can't put it on YouTube because then the, t- the channel is going to get shut down. So, it, yeah. you know, we, we, we can only do so much here. But, you know, I, I'm guessing you watch a lot of that guy on the broadcast this year, you know, following mm-hmm. ASU games, you know, Um is were you seeing similar technique, similar results against better competition than that, you know, Southern Utah game? Yeah, I mean, like he had a great game against USC this year. Um, he, I mean, he had a great game against USC last year um, with, you know, Tufele out there. Um, I know Tufele didn't play the other dude. I forgot the other guy's name. Uh, the, the other really good Samoan player. Uh, he, had, he had a, a good game yeah. against him. So, I mean, I mean, he's, he's a center that's starting a lot. Played a lot of center. I, th- I think that he has a chance. You know, usually what I wanted to show against him against Southern Utah is technique is technique. No matter what, no matter who you're playing against, he has great technique, and he's a you know he has uh, you know great understanding of what he's trying to do as a center. So I, I really wanted to show that more than anything. You know, I, I know he's not going to get beat by Southern Utah guys, but you can see why he doesn't get beat by Southern Utah guys because his and, technique is fantastic. Yeah. So um, it, you know, to me, it's like it's like a boxer fighting a slouch. Okay, you got to yeah. dominate them, mm-hmm. right? So if we're yeah. watching, uh, you know, if you, and that's kind of like the way you got to look at it. If you're watching a team, you're watching a player, and they're playing against a lower level of competition, are they dominating? You know, like okay, that's fine. That che- that checks the box off. It's not you can't knock that. You know, like he didn't get to choose his schedule. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. Like you got to play against who you play against. So mm-hmm. if he's playing that lower level of competition, are we seeing them dominate? Right. And then that checks the box off, you know. Um, but as far as level of competition goes, Pac-12, Big 12, you know, these teams honestly, or these conferences honestly, even though they're Power 5 conferences, they don't usually have, like, great uh, defensive line and offensive linemen in this conference, like NFL caliber, as much as, like, the ACC or the SEC does, you know. Yeah. Uh, so you, you got to kind of take it with a grain of salt. It's not, you know, we know, there are players – that come off the offensive line from Pac-12 who are good, right? But more often we're seeing ACC players, Big Big Ten players, and SEC players as far as linemen goes, right, in the NFL yeah. uh, for the most part. So, I mean, same same with defensive linemen. I mean, you, you'd you rather pick from, um, you know, those big bigger schools because the competition of defensive line is different. I mean, that's why, you know, Kaelon Thibodeau, you know, a lot of teams are off him because, I mean, yeah, sure that he was able to kind of just beat a lot of those – you know, Pac-12 or, you know, defensive, you know, offensive tackles. But, you know, he, does he have the bend to get around the corner against a premier offensive tackle? Because Sean Ryan dominated him. I don't know where Sean Ryan's going. So Sean Ryan did not have a – didn't he didn't give him any problems at UCLA. And Sean Ryan's probably like a top 100 player as offensive tackle. So he didn't give T- – Thibodeau didn't give him any issues. <laughs> so that's so it's like things like that when you look at players yeah competition is important you want to watch them against the best competition right you want to watch that so you, you want if if you know you see some guy against great competition dominating and then you see him against uh another guy getting beat up that's why how i feel about jameson williams and people like people see me 
and like, oh, you don't like Jameson Williams? It's like, well, yeah, because he played he played Elam and got his butt kicked. <laughs> you know, like the, there's things like that that give you red flags about certain players about where you take them value wise. But um, you do want to see players get the best competition. I'll say that. All right. Uh, anything else before we get to uh, your part of that? Uh, Everyone talking about our receiver gonna have a big year. You see Josh Jacobs rushing over a thousand this year. I say yes and no. Depends on if he. I, mean, I don't know if he's going to get the ball. I don't know. I don't yeah. Know if he's get the ball. <laughs> are, are we gonna run? Is the real question. Yeah. How often does during the course of Josh McDaniels' career as an offensive coordinator? And even going back to maybe his head coaching days at Denver, like how often are backs hitting that thousand yard mark for him? Uh, it depends on the year. No, Sean Moreno probably did one of those yeah, years. No, right? he did. Not when McDaniels was there. No, Sean Moreno. No, not him a thousand yards with Peyton Manning. Yeah, for sure. Okay, um, so not but before with McDaniels. No, okay, so there you go. Well, Damian Harris. I mean, Damian Harris last year. Right, but that's with a rookie quarterback. So I mean, I don't know how. Well, he didn't hit a thousand either. He didn't. Hit, no, no, he didn't hit a thousand nowhere. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't hit a thousand. He only had two hundred carries. I guess he got hurt a little bit though. Yeah, he they they cycle through backs. They cycle through backs in this offense. We're going to see more backs than we that we have well, seen. Well, take Josh Jacobs in fantasy because Damian Harris had fifteen touchdowns. God damn! I did not know that. <laughs> So, yeah, take John Jacobs in fantasy if you have Jacobs because he's obviously getting some red zone love. If anything. But, yeah. All right. Any other questions? Any other questions? Uh, uh, Angel, are we, who'd be the guy, if any, if we get back in the draft by moving um, on from picks, past picks at all? Who'd be the guy, if any? You mean like, He's saying, is Darren Waller going to get traded? Is Brian Edwards going to get traded? Kenyon Drake? Are these guys going to get traded? They're not for, trading Darren for... They're not trading Darren Waller. I, I, I kind of want to get that out of there. I, I you know, um, If you watch the Pivot Pivot podcast episode with um, Darren Waller, he went and talked to Josh McDaniels. So they obviously have some kind of understanding, even if they went and go get Devontae Adams. They have some kind of understanding about how many targets he's going to get. So um, I wouldn't expect him to get traded. I would expect that more last year because I think his contract next year, I mean, because his contract's 2023. So if, if he doesn't play well this year, then I would expect that. But I, I expect them to, to exhaust Waller as much as possible at the age that he's at. So yeah. that's what I expect. And I don't expect him to – like there is a lot of buzz from them moving in the first round. I don't know what that's about because I don't think there's any a guy that is worth that. That's what I was talking on the radio today. I'm like, who really is worth trading into the first round? Kenneth Walker? And that would piss everybody off. No, no. <laughs> that would that would make no. Twitter go no. off if they traded like their two fifths a, a second the year before and traded up to the first round to take Kenneth Walker. <laughs> That's the only guy I can think of that would be like an impact player for what the what they want to do. Yeah. And I still think, you know, they're looking for potentially, you know. A, a veteran to come play that extra safety spot. Yeah. You know, I'm skeptical that drafting a rookie to play that kind of joker safety, you know, role um, that Logan Ryan played, you know, um, you know, for Patrick Graham in the past, uh, I, I think that's too much for a rookie. So I'm skeptical that that's that the, the replacement or that role is going to be filled by someone who's, you know, who's going to be just starting off fresh in the NFL. I'm really skeptical of that. So uh, I don't think that they're necessarily going to trade up to, to fill that, you know, yeah. or to get a safety early. I don't think so. No. All right. Uh, I think we're good. Uh, just, just, do they cycle running back because they have a bell cow? Yeah. They, I mean, they have a bell cow sometimes. It just depends on the year. They, they have, they have bell cows. Look at Blunt, Stephen Ridley. Yeah. Depends Sonny Michelle. Yeah. All right. All right, BD. Let's, let's get to your segment. Yeah. All right, cool. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about Jayon Brown. Okay. Uh, Jayon Brown, he's a guy who, you know, the Raiders picked a lot of people immediately were thinking, hey, is this a guy that is going to be, um, is this playing here? Okay, here we go. Yeah. 
Uh, is this going to be a guy who's going to compete, be competing for a starting spot? Well, let's pump the brakes on that. First, let's look at where he is. He's playing um, weak side linebacker in this scheme, and he's going to be in a Tampa 2 zone. And watch him go ahead, carry this 2. That's Cooper Cup. When, Co when Cooper Cup goes to the corner, you see his eyes get back over here, run underneath. Look at that. How many yards? He's 40 yards down the field running down here with safeties at safety level with a, with a wide receiver. He can move. Okay, Jayon Brown, he can really move. Okay, he's a Tampa 2 pole runner in a scheme that is going to be a lot of too high. You need that kind of guy. Look at him. He's getting into his drop. He's got great depth. He's in the middle of the hashes here. He's being able to get vision on the quarterback with the peripheral uh, vision, looking at that tight end, being able to feel that tight end out of the corner of his eye while, while getting an eye on the quarterback. So we see him ma maintain that great uh, zone spacing. Here's another one. Um, they're going to go ahead and play a single high where he's got man on the number three receiver. Watch him wall this receiver off. Look at him. He's, he's almost like a D-back here, okay? We're shadowing this guy. We're mirroring this guy. This is a great cover trap down here, okay? Fantastic job. 20 um, million. You see, uh, yeah, Christian Kirk, yeah. Can't even be a uh, linebacker in coverage. Oh, my goodness. Getting 20 million. Here's another one right here. He's playing <laughs> He's playing man. This is cover one robber. He's playing man on the number three. You see him. He's got the hips. He's got the fluidity. He can run with wide receivers. That's a rare skill set for a – linebacker to have so i do think that there is upside here in coverage you see him here this is a fire zone he does a fantastic job getting in this passing lane you know um from from the end zone angle you see colin murray come off this guy here because jaron brown's in that passing window go ahead and check it down so he has some impact here okay and i had to put this one in he's coming on a blitz he reads out of the blitz pops out Gets a little interception. Great reflexes here to get interception. Okay, so there is definitely upside when it comes to coverage. Okay, solid coverage. Okay, so what about run defense? What about his run fits? Okay, let's watch him here. Jam Brown, remember, six foot, 230. He's undersized for a linebacker. If he gets a, an alley, he gets a clear path to the ball carrier. Yeah, I think he does fine. Okay, you see him make a tackle in the hole, fill that hole. I think that's a great run read. Here's another great run read. Okay, where you see him sift through the trash. He's unblocked. If he gets a clear path to the ball carrier, I think he's just fine against the run. Okay, But the problem is, in the NFL, you don't always get a clear uh, path to the ball carrier. Here's Rodney Hudson coming out on him. Okay, And you just see he's a guy where if he gets touched, he will not make a tackle, unfortunately. I went through, poured through so many games. There is very little evidence that this guy can get off a block no offense to the man, okay? It's obviously hard, easier said than done. You see him here. If he gets touched, he's going to get folded in, in the line, at the line of scrimmage. Um, and, you know, we're just going to keep on going. I'm, I might cut this short because some people might think this is gratuitous, okay? But there was more of these where once he gets touched, he kind of just gives himself up. There's no urgency to get off a block. And you see him on the ground quite a bit, unfortunately, um, you know, so it's a problem. And, and really, it's for me, it's the lack of urgency. It's just, you know, he's just kind of gives himself up when he does get blocked. You see these guys over here, they're urgently trying to get off the ball. And 55 is getting uh, driven back into the backfield. Here's another one. Okay, he's just going to get shoved to the ground here. Okay, he's get he gets tossed around way too much. Okay, here's another one. He's out here on the on the perimeter. You see him a little tight end, wide receiver, whoever this is, gets a block on and can't make that play in space. Okay, it's literally if he gets touched by here, here he is with the red sleeves. If he gets touched by a guy, it's over. He's not making the tackle. Okay, he's going to get driven back all the way back to the safety level. Um, and even in space, we see him here. Okay, even in space, not able to get off these blocks. He, he just has a really tough time doing it. Um, and for that reason, you know, uh, 55. This is not a starter in this defense, okay? This guy, I mean, how many times am I going to show him on the ground here? Um, and I, I, I'm, I, I cut it short because I don't want people to get mad at me thinking that I'm, I'm uh, punch, punching down on the guy. But, uh, you know, when I watch his tape, I think, sure, there is some upside in coverage. And I think that immediately because I 
I saw his height and weight was so similar to Denzel Perryman. I'm thinking, okay, maybe he's Denzel Perryman's backup, but he's not Denzel Perryman's backup. He plays the weak side linebacker in this scheme. The Tennessee Titans ran a very similar scheme. Remember, Mike Vrabel comes from the Patriots, um, as does um, Patrick Graham, who was the defensive line coach with the Patriots. Patrick Graham's defensive fronts are very similar to the Patriots, um, almost a carbon copy. And so he's running a very similar scheme to what um, what Jayon Brown has already had experience in, and Jayon Brown played the weak side linebacker in that scheme. So I think that really he's competition and depth and maybe an insurance policy for if Divine Diablo isn't able to go or gets hurt or just isn't absorbing the scheme. Okay, but Divine Diablo is the prototype for what they want in terms of the length at that position and the coverage ability. Okay. And I think Jayon Brown is kind of just there to mentor and, and, you know, be a stopgap in case Devon Diablo isn't ready or gets hurt. But I don't foresee a situation where this guy, Jayon Brown is a starter and just simply because he can't get off a block and he, and he adds, adds no value in the run game. Um, and that's what you, that's what you need for your linebackers. Your linebackers need to get off blocks. Okay. Uh, obviously we're playing in the AFC West where there's going to be a lot of passing. Don't get me wrong. Okay. Um, so if he is out there, it's not like the end of the world. I just don't yeah. like, we didn't see Denzel Perriman get shoved around like that. We weren't seeing Denzel Perriman on the ground like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Similar height and weight, similar, you know, um, athletic profile, but Denzel Perriman has the urgency, the strength, just like the absolute grit. Like he's not getting blocked, you know, whereas Jayon Brown has a really tough time when he does get when someone latches onto him. So for that reason, I don't really see him uh, competing for a starting position, in my opinion. But we'll see. Yeah, because, uh, you know, I really like Diablo. I think Diablo has a lot of upside just just to see how he transitioned from a safety to a linebacker and then just played the run that well i mean just the transition from that position to come up and play gaps and have an understanding of it that tells me that he's he's a hard worker right that kind of tells you what kind of player he is what kind of person he is he's able to, to embrace i'm going to play linebacker and i'm going to learn how to play as a run I, maybe i got to get my strength up whatever i got to do to to get my job in the nfl and that's why I'm super excited about his future because I'm sure he's working his butt off like right now as we speak, you know, trying to get better and become a more of a linebacker in the NFL because I think he has some serious, serious upside that he I mean he could take that Tate Crowder role that Tate Crowder played. Yes. That take it out of the out of the sky if he could take that to the next level. And you know, just his leadership skills, I mean, even like his speech he had, like after one of the losses, you can tell that there's more to him than just, you know, playing in the NFL. There's a little bit of a leadership at the linebacker position that he has, too. There's a, lot, a little bit of a leader in him. Um, that's why I'm super excited about him. I'm super excited about his future. And it, it's just – that's why I, like, I make fun of PFF all the last all the time because, you know, they gave him such a high grade against the run. And he, they know that, the, you know, it's like Raiders have no talent, but you just give all their, their young players high 70s. But whatever. Anyways. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and going back to you know Tate Crowder, and we could talk about Devon Diablo. Yeah, Tate Crowder was a seventh round pick, and you know he became a starter in Patrick Graham's defense. And I think Devon Diablo is a step up in caliber of, of athlete and caliber of a prospect than Tate Crowder is. And you know, to to Devon Diablo's credit, when he started, when he became the starter in place of Corey Littleton, there was no drop off. Right. Mm -hmm. And he and Devon Diablo did not become like an impact player. Right. But now there was Corey Littleton. So there was no drop off there. And at that point, it's, yeah, play the younger guy, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and we got, we saw a lot of buy in from the linebackers, even Corey Littleton playing the run much better than they had in the past under Paul Gunther. So, you know, he, they got that buy in. Um, I think Denzel Perriman was also the straw that stirred the drink there, you know, in terms of helping guys get you know ready to go and geeked up and you know have that mentality like i'm going to throw my body against the wall here you know so i think devon diablo kind of you know fed off that and saw what it takes to play it's about like just unleashing your aggression right um something that you don't necessarily have to do every every um snap at, at safety position but you have to like live that it has to be you know that has to be in your heart when you're playing linebacker um so i i i think that 
one of the guys who is poised for a breakout season is Devon Diablo. Yeah. And Jayon Brown is going to back him up. Yeah, maybe we see both those guys on the field in a 4 2 5, but again, in, or in, in the nickel. But yeah. again, um, uh, Jayon Brown played weak side linebacker. He didn't play Mike linebacker, right? Yeah. So he, you know, he would have to learn a new position. You see what I'm saying? Like that's Rashawn uh, Evans played Mike linebacker for Tennessee, 6'3", 250 pound linebacker. Reggie Ragland, Dante Hightower, 6'2", 250, 6'4", 250 pound linebackers. That's who plays middle linebacker in the scheme, and we don't have that guy right now. Yeah. So, um, so I, I, yeah, I, I don't see with how much struggle Jayon Brown had playing the run at weak side linebacker when he's the protected man in the front going to Mike linebacker and then having to take on even more blocks. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't see him playing there. So I don't see him and Diablo Diablo on the field at the same time. That's, that's just my opinion because like that he never played Mike before. So I just don't see him doing that. Yeah. So, I mean, the only guy that fits that profile you're talking about is Darren Beavers in the draft that I can think of. I mean, he's a, I mean, he did the, 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 the Dante Hightower role. Yes. Uh, Yes, he rushed off the edge too. I mean, you watch him against Notre Dame or any other team, he rushed off the edge on third down. So that's why that's why he, he's like a guy for me too. That he's probably eighty six is somebody that they're looking at. They really really like. I, I bet they really really like him. I know I know Nagy didn't say said that they weren't at the um, Cincinnati pro day, but they were. They were at that pro day. So the coaches coaches weren't there, but scouts were there, right? Scouts were there. Yeah. 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 Which is that's the important thing. The scouts were there, um, so um, yeah, Dante Hightower is still a free agent. That is very true. He still is a free agent. As well. Yeah. So um, well, I'm, we there there is there is another free agent that is interesting to me. I'm actually going to look it up because I almost can't believe it. But I think Kareem Jackson is a free agent. He is Kareem Jackson is a free agent. He's 33. That's why. Um, but Kareem Jackson. That would be – that's the Logan Ryan role, that joker safety. Is he a nickel? Is he a safety? You know, that kind of player. Kareem Jackson could step in immediately, and like, there, there would be no drop-off. He would have that. So that would be an enticing option there. And I think, uh, um, I think honestly, what's happening is the Wizards are waiting on Tyron Matthew to choose a team, and Tyron Matthew's taking his time. Yeah, he is taking his time. But I mean, he's he's gonna go to the Saints. Like, come on, he's yeah, he's gonna play at the Saints, right? Of course. Yeah, he wants to, he wants to go back home for sure. He's thirty. Let me go back to my home team. It's like Devontae Adams. That's why he wants to go play right. for the Raiders right. more than Derek Carr. Yeah. So to... I just confirmed with my producer, the internet browser, Kareem Jackson is a free agent. So, <laughs> um, hey, I, I didn't realize. I did, I really didn't real, realize that. So that's something I think. Some of these pieces are going to start falling once some of these other high profile names, Stephon Gilmore, still in the open market, Tyron Matthews, still in the open market. So, once these guys pick a team and they're in no rush, why, why rush? You know, like I'm, you have to go to um, OTAs, screw that if you're a veteran, you know. So, they're probably going to wait until a couple OTAs go by before they sign. And then we're going to see some of these other like mid tier um, corners and safeties start going after them. I would get, I would bet. See, see, that's my thing too, you know, like, because Glaze Campbell's out there too, man. I just, I, would, I just want Glaze Campbell so bad. <laughs> he doesn't have to come on yeah. the team until November. <laughs> <He could. laughs> we ain't got to sign him until November. I just want eight games from Glaze Campbell. I just want eight fresh games from Glaze Campbell. It's, it's really all I need. And I, I feel like that would what, make it all complete because. He's going to ball for at least eight. He's going to give you at least yes. eight. Games yes. He's balling. And he doesn't get hurt a lot either. Well, the other thing, obviously, this guy's been struggling with injuries. But um, um, what they signed last year, why am I blanking on his name? The uh, the DT. <sighs> why am I blanking on his No, 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 no. Like the actual big profile from, from um, Tampa? No, from um, yeah, from Tampa. Oh, Sue, the N- Dominican Sue. Are you thinking of? No, that's not who I'm thinking of. Gerald McCoy. Gerald McCoy is still rostered. 
he's still under contract, right? I don't think so. I think it was one year. He, he said he said uh, on Twitter he's not going anywhere. Is what he said. Oh, if they like him, I guess. I mean, hey, McCoy. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, everyone was like McCoy, you idiot. Yeah, I know. Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, uh, McCoy. I, I mean, he, he, so he might be in the plans too. And that's another guy where it's like, yeah, cool your jets, you know, play late in the season. You know, I, I'd be fine with that too. But yeah, Clay's Campbell, obviously, slam dunk home run, you know, um, but then maybe, maybe Jerry McCoy is also in the mix as well, just based off of, you know, he keeps on saying, let's go. Every time the Raiders like sign someone on Twitter, people are like, wait, are you on the team? He's like, I'm not going anywhere. So I think that that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. All right, man. Um, is it any, uh, anything else? Any questions? Is it, I'm a boy Terry. Yes. He, he wants to know who's the best sleeper free agent signing so far. Someone people aren't talking, aren't talking about much. Well, I got to get through all of them. I got to get through all of them here. I, I got through Rocky Sin. I got through Anthony Avery. I got through Jalen Brown. Still want to, the next guy I think I'm going to watch is Vernon Butler. Um, I'm interested in that guy just because of the size and uh, that he has. I want to see maybe if there's any upside. I watched Andrew Billings. I've watched Bilal Nichols. I don't know if those guys are necessarily going to be, you know, impact players. Uh, I was actually disappointed in Andrew Billings' day because I remember him being like a guy that I really liked coming out and a guy who played the run really well. And yeah. then I saw, I saw him in the NFL and he's not playing the run that well. So, um, yeah, I mean, he not. did, he did, he didn't last, he didn't last time he played football. He didn't last year at all, but he still played the run well before he took the COVID thing off. You got to go back. To oh, football. I see. He took yeah. COVID off and then he came back last year and he didn't play well. Right. I saw, I mean, yeah, may, maybe we'll see, you know, a resurgence. Hopefully we see a lot better tape from a lot of these guys, honestly, that were that are getting signed on the defensive side of the ball. Um, Cause I'm again, like Bilal Nichols, like if it's not a great, I'm not going to like go through a breakdown if there's nothing to show you guys, you know what I'm saying? So I'm not, I'm not going to put up like just nothing but low lights of a player. I'll just tell you, there's not a lot to look at. Hopefully we see something better. Uh, but right now I think, Majority of these guys are against under just really role players mm -hmm. who are maybe going to be competing. I think Rocky Sin is probably the only guy who is going to be like a starter for sure. Other than that, it's like mostly depth uh, pieces, you know, for the most part. Yeah, because I mean, I'm trying to think of any offensive signings that I can think of. I mean, besides Devontae Adams, I mean, obviously, yeah. Yeah, course, I, mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's like, the, of course, the, there's those guys, but yeah. I mean, it's the sleeper ones. I mean, I, I mean, I guess you know, Illuminor. You know, I really liked his tape. I really like how he played. Um, really like how he came out there and filled in. You know, to this day, I have no idea why he got benched. I still have no idea. It doesn't make any damn sense to me, because even when like everybody was getting beat, he was the only one not getting beat. So I don't know what what they were watching. So. Um, I am excited about him coming back. So here's why. Here's why. Tom Cable was like, you're not doing my technique. And he's Jermaine Illuminar. I was like, well, your technique sucks. That's why everyone was getting beat. And Tom Cable was like, you have to do my technique. <laughs> That's probably what happened. 100%. 100%. <laughs> and it's probably what happened. Probably what happened to Jim Brown. Jim Brown's like, what, what are you having us do? Like, what is this? What is this? <laughs> All right. So we got a question right here from Usman. Okay. He says, does Abram work as a linebacker? No disrespect to you, Usman. I hear I see this question a lot. A five foot eleven, two hundred five pound player is not a linebacker in the NFL. I'm sorry. He is not a linebacker. He can't play linebacker. He's not big enough. Okay. So a lot of people are saying that. I think what we're what we're trying to say is he's a second level player only. Like he, is he is he a deep safety? I think I mean We'll see. We'll see in this scheme if, if that happens, how, how often he plays deep. But yeah, I think he's a second level player. Mostly that's where we see the best impact from him. Um, so like blitzing off the edge, stuff like that, stuff like Landon Collins and Jamal Adams and, you know, uh, these safeties are maybe a little bit more limited in coverage, but their teams still get good production out of them playing on the second level, but not necessarily playing linebacker. Right, they're playing like nickel or slot, or they're blitzing off the edge, stuff like that. Um, and only maybe playing linebacker in dime on third and twelve. That's not playing linebacker, right? That's being a, a subgrouping player, you know. So yeah. I, I, yeah, but first down, no, he's not going to be. 
you know, playing linebacker on first down. So yeah, I, but I see that a lot from Usman. Thanks, for, thanks for answering that. Uh, quite or asking that question. I he's not a linebacker in the NFL. There's no such thing as a five foot eleven, two hundred five pound linebacker. Sorry. All right, all right. Um, anything else, PD? Okay, yeah, we're good. So next, uh, next time we come around, I'm gonna try to have some draft prospects along with my uh, free agent breakdown. But I'm gonna be looking at Vernon Butler uh, next. Hopefully, we see like something good from them because so far the defensive lineman that i've scouted there's nothing to really write home about or show you guys in terms of free agents um so hopefully we see something good for Brendan butler and then i'm going to try to look at some corners um so yeah that's it for me yeah uh that's it for me guys um uh, make sure you guys uh check out um i dropped something on silver black pride about athleticism uh, very important so check that out and then uh yeah and then you know we're gonna be doing some more stuff i want to get some josh jacobs power stuff going here because I want to talk about that. I mean, that's, uh, that's a big thing. Can Josh Jacobs run power? So I'm trying to grind those numbers, guys. I didn't chart the Chiefs game because it was 48 to 9, so I have to go through that game and watch it. So uh, <laughs> I have to go that through that torture to get you guys this content, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. The one game I didn't chart this year was that one. And I'm like, God damn it. Stop. I gotta yeah. Stop in the second quarter. So, <laughs> but I'm going to do it. I'm going to go through. I'm going to get every power run from Josh Jacobs that game. You know, probably not that many runs. I'm going to get it, though. We're going we're gonna to figure it out. Um, and i uh, get you guys some power information about him running power. But anything other than that, guys, just make sure you guys subscribe to the channel. Uh, check out the other things that we got up there. And uh, we're out. That's it, Raider Nation. Holla at you. Peace out, guys.